uh, thank you all for coming. Uh, just before I introduce our panel, I want to say a special word of thanks to two people. Uh, first of all, to uh, Lila Kastu, uh, who first had the idea of mounting this series of screenings of Holly Frampton's films, and uh, specifically of locating them in an art world context. Uh, she's worked very closely with Adam Hyman, a film forum, and Adam's done an enormous amount of work uh, emailing people, arranging people, fighting with projectionists, getting prints here, arguing with everybody. And it's uh, uh, typical of the tremendous work that Adam does on behalf of Experimental Film here in Los Angeles. So I'd like to start by thanking these two people for very much. We decided that we'd get a, a spectrum of different kinds of, uh, of people who might have an interest in Hollis Frampton. Uh, so we, we have an artist, a curator, a writer, and a gallery uh, owner. Uh, beginning on my left is Madison Brookshire, who is an artist and filmmaker. He's shown his work in many uh, festivals, in New York Film Festival, Rotterdam Film Festival, and he at present has a residency at the Hammer Museum. Brooke, uh, Madison. Uh, Alex Klein is an artist based in Los Angeles. Uh, she received her MFA from UCLA and has a couple of degrees in art history. Uh, she was one of the organizers of the Around uh, Photography Conference at the uh, Hammond Museum recently. And she currently has appointments at uh, LACMA and at USC. Uh, my far right, uh, Michael Nedholte, is a writer, critic, and independent curator. Uh, he writes regularly for Art Forum, I read him there almost every month, and he's taught at USC and he's currently a uh, visiting faculty at CalArts. And then on my immediate right we have Lila. Uh, Lila is the owner of the Castro Gallery, a contemporary art space that was founded in November a couple of years ago, and her gallery features a roster of uh, artists established and emerging from all over the world. So I'm very glad that we have these four people here uh, with us today. Um, I thought we might start out with uh, short statements by uh, each of our panelists on why they find Frampton in general, and perhaps these two films uh, of especial interest. To me, uh, the interest, uh, art world and film world, uh, interest in Frampton right now is somewhat uh, counterintuitive. In many ways, he seems to me to be very different uh, from uh, uh, most of the prevailing ethos. And so I thought these guys would give us some sense of why we should be uh, interested in Frampton. Does anybody want to start, or shall I pick Ned? <laughs> <laughs> I'll pick Ned, because I know Ned's got something written. I have a statement. That's true. Um, yeah, David asked, uh, I mentioned this uh, question in advance, and I woke up in a panic this morning and <laughs> wrote this down. Um, I'm just going to read it. Uh, although I studied film as an undergrad, for whatever reason, I wasn't exposed to Hollis Frampton's work until much later. The first film of his I saw was Nostalgia, appropriately enough. Last semester I was teaching a class titled What Makes an Art, a mandatory class for new undergraduates at CalArts. I screened Nostalgia for the class, I suspect with some intent to provide them with an experience I was denied for too long. Frampton is important to me for a number of reasons. These are the most significant. His command of language is equal to his command of the image, and he mastered the art of bringing both together with film. Of course, he made many films without language, or even sound, but the film, films we watch today, and particularly Nostalgia, are excellent examples of image and language coming together. Economy. One reason I wanted to show my students Nostalgia is because Frampton was able to do so much with very limited resources. This, I think, is an important lesson for young artists and an important reminder for all of us especially in the age of the $400 million film. As a critic who writes on art and film and on their overlaps, I often look to Frampton as a model. He set a high bar. In fact, I'd say as a filmmaker slash theorist, he occupies a remarkable position in the second half of the 20th century that was held by Eisenstein in the first half. Frampton understood the medium of film and his own relationship to it by examining its ontological extremes. At one extreme, the still image as a basic unit, a building block. And uh, obviously from nostalgia, uh, we all know that he was a prolific still, still photographer. And at the other extreme, a vast, ongoing, accumulative project he referred to as infinite cinema. 
in which all film ever shot constituted a sort of mathematically sublime metacorpus. Today, the unfolding obsolescence of, the, of celluloid and in the staggering expansion of digital image making, along with its effortless sharing and archiving, Frampton's conceptual model of the infinite cinema is hardly outmoded, but rather serves as a proleptic framework with which the filmmakers or video makers slash theorists of today or the near future should have to contend, just as Frampton contended with Eisenstein before him. Thank you. You can't be answered. Lila. Well, I really like the point about the economy. I think that's quite relevant today. And I don't really know exactly why Frampton might appeal. And I was honestly very surprised by the responses we've been getting and how packed every screening is. And that's been so exciting for me. So maybe that it can unfold and explain itself as we go down the line. But what I thought about for myself and what I find so attractive is I think there's such a um, sense of exploration and adventure in all the films and there's such a wide variety in the films. Um, Yvonne Rayner wrote some notes for our previous screening. She said that um, she mentioned how Frampton most likely would not have appreciated being pitched, pinned down in P. Adam Sidney's structuralist cubbyhole. And um, it's very clear, we see even in just these two films, how broad the spectrum is and how much risk taking and exploration there is. And there's also sort of this like freedom without the fear of failure. And I don't think that everything he did was genius, but there's um, certainly like constancy and that I think is something a young artist could definitely take and, and run with this idea that you experiment and you keep working and not everything's going to be amazing but you can have some really good bound. Great. Alex? Okay. Well, um, I also wrote something because I'm terrible in these kinds of situations, so I'll just read it. Um, in his introduction to his essay on Edward Weston, Everything in Its Place, Paul Scranton recounts a story about traveling to visit a major Western retrospective at an unnamed Midwestern museum. Upon arriving in the afternoon for what he had expected to be only a short visit, he was surprised to find over 400 prints on view, and as a result decided to extend his trip by another day or so so that he could spend more time with the finely crafted photographs. In his account, the flight that he had originally been scheduled to take home ended up colliding midair with another aircraft, killing everyone but a sole survivor. He writes, a 10-year-old boy fell two miles into the streets of Brooklyn. I well remember a newspaper photograph from that day. The broken child, surrounded by ambulance and police attendants and police, lay on the pavement in front of an Iglesia Pentecostal called Pillar of Fire. Since then, I have never been able to decide whether Weston tried to kill me or saved my life. <laughs> in turn, I would say that this is a question that I've asked myself with regard to Frampton and his prolific body of work. Has Frampton tried to kill me, or has he saved my life? For as a young artist and writer, it can be daunting, especially when concerned with lens-based media. It can often seem that Frampton has already anticipated and wrestled with all of the important questions. So David asked us to say a few words today about how we individually came to Frampton and his importance for us as young practitioners. My relationship to Frampton is probably a bit backwards compared to everyone else on the panel today. For I probably came to the films last of all, and even so I tend to read all the films through my own biased lens of photography. I initially was introduced to Frampton in my undergraduate art history studies as more of an associate than a protagonist figure or practitioner. That is, I knew him primarily through his connection to Frank Stella and Carl Andre, and eventually as a photographer and writer and finally a filmmaker. But even the films, which ostensibly have written themselves with the condition of still photography, of a medium that cannot seem to contain its own history, I find so much to think about the conditions of photographic representation and the slippage of meaning therein, and I think these two films are and although Frampton does not write explicitly about what I would call a kind of photography by other means, he incessantly addresses these issues in his writing and films, underscoring the friction and frustration of words and images, language and photographs, often bringing up Apollinaire's calibrant as a touchstone of this sort of collision. In my own practice, I am attracted to and hunger for this discourse, which is one reason for my own institutional affiliation. So I think, I think that part of the reason that the milieu of Frampton holds such an allure for me and my peers is the intensity and the literary wit of the conversations, 
that even with their utmost seriousness and sincerity, something like Andre's and Trenton's 12 dialogues, maintains a level of revelatory humor amidst the youthful gravitas. I also find it comforting to know that as eloquent and prolific as Rampton was, he, he referred to his own critical writing as a kind of dread obligation. That as artists, we are in a sense beholden to a tradition that asks us to push our own discourse forward on our own terms. Thus reminding me that however familiar some of the problems posed by Frampton may seem to reverberate in our present moment, that if he were alive today, he would continue to challenge us with his work and observations. So with that in mind, um, and just returning to the original question of whether, um, or the bastardization of his question of whether he's trying to save or kill us, I would say yes, he is most definitely still trying to save us. Thank you. Madison. These are uh, hard hacks to follow. <laughs> um, well, Frampton was very good at acknowledging uh, his own influences and the kind of debts that he owed to previous um, thinkers and uh, artists uh, in his writing and in his film. And uh, I guess that I also feel a sort of uh, a debt to him, uh, largely because of all the, the things that have been mentioned so far, the kind of territories that he was able to uh, go into, uh, both in critical thinking and in filmmaking. So I actually wanted to um, start my little introduction with a quote from Robert Smithson, uh, made in an interview with uh, Patricia Norville in 1969. Smithson said, all legitimate art deals with limits. Fraudulent art feels that it has no limits. The trick is to locate those elusive limits. You're always running against those limits, but somehow they never show themselves. Um, Pound, of course, kind of famous, I mean, excuse me, Frampton rather famously um, left college before he finished it. He needed like a few required courses and refused to take them. Uh, and then went to study with Edward Pound. And by study, I mean um, visit him in the mental hospital where he was staying and listen to him recite the cantos in their entirety with a sort of verbal um, footnoting, uh, which was, you know, pretty enormous uh, thing to experience. So maybe Frampton knew better than most of us. Um, Pound's failings as an artist and a thinker. Uh, so Frampton viewed the Cantos as an enormous failure, a total catastrophe, he said. Um, and he gave this reason in another interview. Uh, you can't bring off a project with those dimensions without a theory of history. And that's an incredibly important um, statement to me. Uh, and I think that Frampton was very, very, very conscious of history. But let me uh, take a second to, think, uh, to say what I think he meant by that. Okay, also famously, uh, uh, you know, the, the Dadaists and the Communists were in exile in Zurich at the same time. And they had um, chances to speak with one another. It would have left to have been a fire in the wall in that bar. Um, so uh, Lenin got to speak to the poet Marku, and they were arguing over who was the more radical. Uh, and eventually Lenin comes to this kind of amazing statement. Uh, he gets quoted often, where he says, I don't know how radical you are, and I don't know how radical I am, but we must both endeavor to be as radical as reality. Uh, this blows my mind. Um, and I think that it explains to me why it is that realism, as opposed to the easiest thing to come by in art, is the hardest thing to come by. Because in fact, reality is radical, and it requires a radical artist in order to, to reveal it, to show it uh, in its radicality, so to speak. Um, Frampton is just such an artist, and Hapax Legomena, uh, which is the total work of which the two films we saw today are, are two parts of, um, there's six parts in total, uh, is also just such a work. So to kind of circle back to Smithson, I think that Hapax Legomena is, in a sense, a kind of intense realism, precisely because it's showing us the reality of the film itself. It's exploring and attempting to define the limits of the cinema, and again, this is uh, why we are still indebted to him and why he's still uh, relevant, because he's shown us the edges of the continent uh, that we inhabit. Anybody want to pick up anything that anybody else has said immediately? Um, I, I would. Um, just the fact that this, I think Francis is maybe underappreciated, and part of the intent with doing this was to bring these films out in the public so we can get as many people as possible to see them and get as much from them. And that was something that I think that what Alex was saying. Well, you're, you're uh, 
estimation for Frampton is uh, very encouraging for me because uh, sometimes I seem to think that his whole project is like trapped in the late 60s, early 70s and massively historically obsolete. Um, around, uh, in the, uh, one of his essays uh, about narrative, um, Frampton uh, proposes, attributes to Brackage, um, Brackage's theorem about the inevitability of, na of narrative, and he says, in this, Black Brackage is playing the devil's advocate. Let me play the devil's advocate for a moment here in this context. Um, around 1972, um, Annette Michelson published a review of the complete uh, writings of André Bazin in our forum. And she went on for a couple of paragraphs and said, well, Bazin does this very well, and Bazin does this very well, and Bazin does this very well. And she got to the end and said something like, but it's all basically irrelevant now because the whole premise of realism in Bazin is historically <coughs> obsolete. And I kind of felt, as a devil's advocate, when I was reading through uh, all the texts last, uh, uh, this last week or so, that this project of, uh, in Madison's terms, of uh, sketching the limits of the medium, of taking film back to its fundamental possibilities, that isn't this basically a kind of Greenbergian project that I thought was dismissed by the early 1970s? Actually, this is something I was, I was thinking about a lot when I was I mean, in our current debates, at least within photography, which I've been thinking about a lot in the last few years, um, through all these kinds of discussions that happened before it's about pictures, of course, abstraction is the, you know, the key thing. One of the things that Frampton writes about a lot is, you know, he's working amongst all these people who are working with an abstraction. He's like this kind of, you know, figural presence amongst all the people who are kind of going to the void. Or the soul illusionist. The soul illusionist, right? right. And for me, I mean, that felt like a completely fresh conversation in the way uh. that it was resonating with current concerns, but also he, the way he was kind of talking about the photograph as being maybe not tied to those Greenberg in terms of, of reductiveness, that you take away the image and all you have left is a piece of paper, is what he says, <laughs> which I thought was a really great thing to say that you can't actually get to the kind of material properties of the photograph just by stripping away the image. And that to me I thought was, was a really kind of actually complex thing to say. Um, as much as he understood the medium of photography as a mechanistic um, medium and 16 millimeter filmmaking, the implications of, of that go beyond that sort of Greenbergian material. I'm not quite sure on that last point. How, how, does, how is this more than an application of the Greenbergian Kantian self-critical method to the medium of film? Well, I think I think in terms of his notion of the infinite cinema, it sets up uh, a way of thinking about the image as a sort of vast reservoir of all possible images. It's almost, it's, it's more boring as, than Greenberg. Good. Um, and it, uh, you know, I think the implications do set up what, what Madison referred to as a sort of theory of history that would include the photographic as a sort of mechanical. And, and in uh, his meta history essay, Cinema is the last machine, um, but he's saying that with an implication that something will come after that as an engineering device. I would, I and mean, that's how I invent. Right. And I think further to that too. I mean, just to really stretch the limits. I mean, Madison brought up Smithson, and I also think of the way that Smithson refers to photography, which is this kind of like site non site dialectic. It's never really quite here or there. And I think that that also applies to you know, some of the things we were just talking about here about how you know the way that we're talking about the photograph and the photograph are always kind of separate language, um, being in, in totally in, in concert with the, with the photograph, but also being completely separated and, and not locatable. Um, I would just add, as someone who doesn't know much about technical properties and material properties of film, I can find things in the content that I find so interesting and fascinating without necessarily knowing the intent, intent of what Frampton was doing. And an uh, interesting conversation after one of the screenings was with a filmmaker named Mark Toscano, who was telling me about, for example, Matrix and the, how Frampton's possibly talking about matrices in the processes of Technicolor. I would never have understood that. Or I would never have understood how difficult it was to make something like Critical Mass. In, the, in Final Cut Pro digital age, like, we don't get that. The 18-year-old USC students coming to my gallery don't get that. 
So they're really coming off of maybe the literary ideas or just the the images and the photography or or the the contents essentially or even just kind of the imagination.
the attempt somehow to include all aspects of all mm -hmm. possible 20th uh, Western poetics into one poem. Mm -hmm. But Frampton was also, um, and this gets back to what you're saying about, about um, uh, paying homage to the, you know, his peers and those who came before him. Um, he was interested with the idea of infinite cinema, of including his work alongside of his peers and everybody else who had made film. So it wasn't the sort of individualized project um, of modernism, but something much larger, mm -hmm. which actually is what YouTube is doing in many ways. Um, you preempted my final question, which is going to be, do you see any evidence of artists working today who are engaged on a similarly comprehensive, totalized, and self-critical project? <laughs> Alex. <laughs> Alex, That's sure. not fair at all. But I had an absolutely other, completely different observation that getting back to Magellan was that um, in thinking about kind of Frampton, it, it keeps striking me that there's this kind of um, similarity with a figure like Walker Evans who also has this kind of like Andover, semi blue blood, but not kind of bastard of that kind of academy. And then also, dies with, the, with this unfinished kind of encyclopedic project. So with, if um, Frampton has like the encyclopedia film, then Evans has this you know really curious uh, alphabet project that he's been working on with the sign and the Polaroids, which it just it's just this kind of funny coincidental thing that I was like thinking about when. And I never see Evans anywhere in, in the literature on Frampton. He always mentions the same you know Western and Strand and Stieglitz, but. Um, that's just a okay. very difficult question. <laughs> <laughs> well, we thought we'd like to end by taking uh, questions and comments for the audience. So if you have any questions for our panelists or suggestions, please uh, speak up. Go ahead. We, I can't see anybody. I was going to wade over to the existence of film as far as his roots. You need to speak as up. As far as his roots, it seems clear from having to do many work of his films that his roots precede film as an art form as a technical possibility, but comes straight from the same roots that Goethe and, and the ancient Greeks come from. And his works, if you see them, I saw most of them for the first time having never read a word that he's written. The films, if you are available to them, insist on your level of attention being that of the primal person at the primal moment, as in saying, anyone alert looking at something. And what his work does in the present tense I think defies period of time. It goes right back into the main roots of Goethe, who had the nerve to talk about his perception of light, as if he were the authority, which everyone is. Everyone with eyes to see light is the authority, and Hollis puts the authority back in the viewer. But how, maybe, how does that relate to the ancient Greeks specifically? The ones who are talking about the nature of their own perception of space, the idea, I mean, this is not the first one that comes to mind, but if you raise your hand, you're lowering the heavens. The idea of you as the viewer, first person, perspective being the prime thing, which is fundamentally at odds with ancient dualism, right? The idea that you require any intermediary between you and ecstasy, or you and Godhead, or you and reality as it is, whatever you are calling your pursuit. The idea of removing the priest, I think, is what he's about, and of um, snapping your attention into the deepest focus in the moment possible, which when you leave the theater after seeing his work, you keep with you as long as you can, and attain your private moments from your own endeavors. Anybody want to riff on that? Well, I would say that it's it's true to an extent that it's kind of like what I was saying about being a bit demanding of the viewer, but then you, you take what you can. But also, I don't know, I think Frampton's very deliberately rigorous and making these very structured systems that when you look deeper and you get some of the layers, he's so masterminding everything. Steve. Going back to your opening question about his relevance, um, it seems to me that this, the material and the subject is totally uh, contemporary, but I think that the way that he is uh, demanding the viewer uh, to have patience and sustained attention span is very not contemporary. 
Uh, it actually is very much an outgrowth, I think, of what is called, you know, the structural period, although, of course, he would have thought of himself as a structuralist. But I think that is the challenge for today. But that's also, I think, one reason why so many, especially younger people, might find this very uh, rewarding and even intoxicating, because he really is stretching out. I mean, poetic justice is like a half an hour of just stretching out the, the imagination with words, you know, and, and in so many ways, uh, uh, things along these lines are done today, but not with the same sensibility. I mean, not with that kind of, you know, demand of a viewer to sustain concentration and really inhabit the territory on their own, you know, over time. It's a fairly rare thing these days. Comments? I was just gonna say, in 1970, what, what year is, were these films? I think the impacts were going is from about 1972 to about 1975. No, it's earlier than that. Uh, yeah, that's right, it's finished by 70. 70 and 71. Because no, okay. in 71, a half hour is still relatively a short film. I mean, <laughs> Michael well, Snow well, is making a I mean, yeah. two hour and 20 minute film at the same time. So the attention span of that period is, I agree with what you're saying in terms of the attention that one needs to, to generate. Uh, for the, the film that we watched and most of Frampton's films in general, but, but there is a, a attention span um, at that time period for various reasons. Um, I suspect that, um, you know, my students don't have the patience to, uh, some of them, not all of them, uh, but some of them do not have the patience to sit through a, you know, five minute Jack Goldstein film. So it's, uh, you know, things have really changed. And, um, uh, but I also think part of, part of what's being asked is not just pure perception. It's, there's so many deferrals going on in a, in a kind of like nostalgia where the sound is separated from the image um, in terms of what we're looking at. Um, or even the fact that it's not actually Frampton reading the first person is Michael Snow. Um, which is, is a crucial point, also very funny at a certain point. Um, so he's, he's actually, it's not just a sort of perceptual threshold that he's, he's pushing, but a, but a certain kind of intellectual threshold as well. Yeah. I mean, I think that also connects with the comments he's made about how does the, does the photographer need to be there with his photographs, and that, you know, when <coughs> Weston or whoever dies, that their photographs didn't just go, you know, burn up right before our eyes, but that there is something that gets disconnected. And I think that's also part of what's going on with the um, in nostalgia, with the disconnect between you know, the biography and you know, the person and time travel. And, um, and of course, we all have our urge to, to burn our photographs. But you save the negatives. <laughs> Not all of them. And then nostalgia, just to talk about that for a little bit, one of the things that's so amazing for me about burning the photograph is, of course, um, oh, what's that discounted theory? Uh, biology and Greek. Recapitulates re by It's not so much discredited as like my class, as I understand it. And of course, he's doing that in every individual shot, just as every individual shot is recapitulating um, the overall project of the whole time that's moment. So, in destroying the still photograph, he produces an image which is uh, you know, unique and necessary to cinema, which is a movement image. Mm -hmm. you know, as it's burning, it's actually more cinematic. Mm -hmm. uh, and of course, by uh, dislocating the narrative forward in time, He's producing cinema as well. So I guess you could think of you know, cinema as photos plus stories, but isn't even better if you have to anticipate uh, a photo. You don't have the image. And of course, we experience that kind of uh, excruciating uh, pleasure of trying to listen to the next story and see the photo and watch it burn. And, and then there's that last photo. image, which is so terrifying. Right. What could it be? And then <laughs> it's inside you, I guess. Right. So. Yeah, I mean, but I think that, just to go back to that Simpson quote, uh, the reason I love it so much is, you know, we're talking about what the project of monumentalism are being defined as contours, but of course for Simpson, the contours never reveal themselves. The work of art has to work within the limits of what it's called, that's what it says, but they're elusive. They, they, the work is always approaching that. So in a sense, I think that Frampton, who's very involved in the uh, ritual, understands the film to be sort of rituals of uh, exposing those limits, and that they, they receive with the uh, uh, with the end of the film. He, he, he never gets there, I think maybe that's the... Well, that, well, that's his definition of a significant work of art. A work of art which takes the codes of the medium and significantly transforms them. Mm. Other questions? Comments? Um, yes?
Yeah. Uh, I, I came in knowing very little about uh, the artist, and then I just wanted to say, in the last film, I found it so powerful because uh, it took an activity such as reading, which is something you had done on a very intimate scale, and it brought all of us, and the film asked all of us to go into like a very pla a place that's very intimate with our memories of our lovers and that kind of thing. And they got all of us to do that on a public forum at the same time. And it brought uh, just the act of reading. You got all of us to read 200 pages all at the same time, which is something so rare nowadays. And I think just that fact alone makes it so relevant to, I think, people of my generation. Did you visualize your lover doing all the things that you were supposed to do? Or visualize yourself doing it? Uh, at first it, it was different, but eventually I did, and it just made the time just fly by, and it was, it was, it was great, you know, I, I tend to really dive into things. I wasn't too much of a metaphysical viewer and questioning, I just allowed myself to enjoy it, and I, I just found it very, I don't know how relevant. When I first saw that film, it totally blew my mind. I just thought it was absolutely amazing. Yeah. Just, just Questions? Other questions or comments? Okay, well, we have to be out of here in three minutes, so I guess that's a good time. <laughs> 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 <laughs>